Let's now ask Mr. Asif Durrani, the Deputy High Commissioner of Pakistan, to give us a few words. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, let's uh, have certain facts uh, current in regard to terrorism. Number one, there is no agreed definition of terrorism. Uh, the United Nations is discussing the word terrorism for the past two decades. And there is no agreed definition what makes terrorism. What is a terrorist? Who is a terrorist? Yesterday's terrorist may be today's hero. Yasser Arafat was a terrorist yesterday. He got Nobel Peace Prize. So was Rabin. So we should not mix our facts. Now we have new terminology. And that is, we call it violent extremism. So since 9-11, the word terrorism has been replaced with violent extremism. We are still grappling with what does it stand for? What does this violent extremism stand for? As for the topic, I'll be able to dwell on half of the topic concerning Pakistan. <coughs> so the myth of terrorism, I think we should not call it terrorism. Uh, I'll settle for the time being to violent extremism, but at the same time with a caveat that for Pakistan, I have repeatedly said 9-11 started 30 years ago when the Soviet troops marched into Afghanistan. There are certain factors for which Pakistan cannot be held responsible. And the Soviet march into Afghanistan is one of them. Pakistan cannot be held responsible for the exodus of Afghan refugees. 5.4 million at its peak in Pakistan and 3 million in Iran. Almost 8 million of Afghans were out of the country two, three decades ago, which means half of the population was out of the country. They were housed, looked after there, whatever the limited resources Pakistan and Iran had. <coughs> but once the Soviet troops marched out of Afghanistan, the few were the champions of human rights, they washed their hands because their job was done. Only Afghans were left to fend for themselves. They had nothing but weapons in abundance. And Pakistan was left to fend for itself along with more than 4 million refugees because by that time 1.4 million refugees had left <coughs> between 1992 to 1994. But again this number increased with the advent of the Taliban. So here we are grappling with a situation where being a Pakistani, I can say that we were not responsible for those factors which led to the death and destruction of 1.5 million Afghans with the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and the equal number were remained. And last year I came from Kabul after my three and a half years stint in that country. That country is still in ruins. You are lucky if you survived a suicide attack because hospitals can't get it from them. Ninety percent of the ills, the sick, <coughs> they go to Pakistan. Sixty to seventy thousand Afghans go to Pakistan, straddle Pakistan border every day without visit. This kind of approach and access is not available to any Afghan anywhere in its own neighborhood. Being Pashtun myself, I can assure Professor Musa Khan Jalalzai, who is a very dear friend, that it's not Pashtun who are at the receiving end. It's the other way around. Those who are killing, Tariq Taliban Pakistan, they were killing Pashtuns. So they have been reacted to. 
I have been telling my journalist friends, I, because I happen to be a, a journalist and Agha Murtaza Poya used to be my boss in the Muslim newspaper, unfortunately, shut down. <coughs> Very best newspaper. So I keep on telling my those friends that we are not responsible for certain factors which led us to this pass. Now the Pashtuns who are killed, and I told my generous friends that why you are giving so much time to the Taliban? They said it's freedom of expression. So my contention was that your freedom of uh, expression, you can only enjoy it till the time you are enjoying the present way of life in Pakistan. The day Taliban came, your heads, your necks would be on the chopping board and you would not be able to defend it. So here when we talk about the human rights, we have to be careful. Because we can talk about the human rights within the confines of constitutionalism. But if there are forces who go ultra-constitutional, who take ultra-constitutional measures, what to do? especially in societies which have been radicalized or which have been made violent during the past three decades. <coughs> they have not learned anything but how to shoot a gun. Those children who were orphans, they, there were no orphanages but these madrasas and luckily in the courts established by our free world. Because in their view, the word Jihad and Mujahideen was quite sexy. It sells in Afghanistan. So here we have to have a little bit of soul searching uh, without being compromising my position as a government servant or as a diplomat representing Pakistan. <clears throat> but there is no harm in stating certain facts, which can be verified all the time. So if a diplomat, not necessarily he will tell you lies all the time, because there are facts which no one can hide. And my friend Professor Jalazai would bear me out, and he will stand by my post. More importantly, let me tell you that when you start doing work so when you, uh, when you revise your policies, there is always a reason to revise your policies. For instance, I know during my stay three and a half years, but from 2005, August 2005 till mid 2007, we handed over 1,000, more than 1,500 of these Taliban to the Afghan government. Most of them were released for various reasons, including some Western journalists who were kidnapped by the Taliban and in return for their release, they were released. But now when we have arrested some big fish, this big hue and cry that while we are entering into dialogue, why they have been arrested. So we, we have to draw certain lines. Now, the policy level in Pakistan is that no one is allowed to use Pakistan soil, irrespective of who is involved. For us, the Taliban, we are not sworn to Taliban. We were not sworn to any of the Mujahideen. Yes, for the time being, at that particular time, those were the policies. We recognized the Kabul governments, whosoever ever ruled, whether it was Babar Kamal, whether it was Sadar Dawood, when they captured Kabul, we had a relationship with them. Perhaps we downgraded, but we had a relationship with them. But I'm not going into the history of that relationship. Neither Pakistan is apologetic by supporting the Taliban because there were other regional forces who were out to destroy that country. So we worked for our national security, we did support. After the 9-11, the world discovered 